Hello and welcome to the lecture for chapter three. In this chapter, I'll talk about where to come up with ideas for businesses, a little bit about basic structures of business and what's gonna go in the company description portion of your business plan. So where to find an idea for starting a business is kind of the most prominent question that most students have at the beginning of this course. My suggestion to you is to think about where either your interests, so it may be a hobby that you have or a talent, you may play on a, a sports team, something that kind of occupies your time outside of school. Look at that. Look at places you may have worked before, your previous work experience. A couple of you have quite a bit of work experience, so you can think about that. Think about what you've learned in school or what kind of training you received or some unrecognized or some recognized unmet need that you might have as a consumer. And then look at where those things overlap with a problem that needs a solution. That's where you're gonna bring something unique to that. As an example, if you are on the baseball team and there is some training component that always has to be handmade or or kind of put together with duct tape and you know that kind of thing. It's never really as good as it should be. Well, every single baseball team faces the same exact problem and has the same issue with training. That's a problem that you've identified. It overlaps with an interest you have and a talent that you have, and you can then produce a solution to that problem and be kind of a uh, credible source to people as to why that's a good solution. That's one example. Another example I really like to share with students uh, is the company Undercover Colors. So this was started by uh, a material science and an engineering student at North Carolina State University. Uh, and as you're aware, a lot of big schools uh, have problems with date rape drugs where uh, people go to parties and uh, females get drinks that have a drug added to them and, and then uh, bad things happen as a result of that. These two students, of course, have friends that are uh, females and they have sisters and girlfriends and all of that um, that face that problem. It's a well-known problem. And they use the education and training that they received as undergraduate students to come up with a product that would address that. The product that they came up with is a fingernail polish where you put your finger in a drink and stir it and if there are drugs in that drink, uh, they will interact with the colors of the fingernail polish and change the color. So it's a way for a woman to, uh, or anybody, uh, to uh, find out if there's something in that, uh, in that drink that they shouldn't be consuming, and then they can leave that party. So they entered a business plan competition uh, at North Carolina State, won a $10,000 prize, uh, they then use that to uh, take their business plan and approach investors. They got $100,000 of investment to start the company and start producing product. Uh, it was successful and a large cosmetics company purchased the company from uh, the product from them for $5.5 million. So that's an example of seeing a problem that exists in society and then seeing where that overlaps with in this case, their uh, science training allowed them to come up with a solution for that problem. I'll, uh, throughout the course, I'll mention some books that I think are beneficial if, this, uh, if starting a business is something you intend to do. Uh, this is one that really helped me quite a bit called Eating the Big Fish. It's a book that was uh, written in the UK. Um, most of you, and this was the case with me as well, are in kind of a David and Goliath situation where you're a small company and you're competing against really big companies. And that could be a real challenge. And, and this book really gives a very good uh, approach to how you can uh, overcome that problem. Essentially that you shouldn't be trying to say the same things your big competitors are saying. You shouldn't advertise the same message that they're advertising, that sort of thing, because they'll, they can shout louder than you can. They can afford more advertising. They have a greater reach than you do. So you need to find something that's relevant to your customers that's different than what your bigger competitors are saying. 
A couple things about basic types of businesses. So there are service businesses, of course, that provide you know, dog walking services or teaching yoga classes or doing somebody's tax return or landscaping. Those are service businesses. Manufacturing businesses take products and turn them into new products. So they take raw materials and convert them into something useful. Wholesaling is buying products from one company and selling them to another company. So it's business to business sales, whereas retailing is business to consumer sales. So if you want to open a food truck or uh, a restaurant or that sort of thing, that is a retailing operation. Uh, and you could also, it could be a combination of those. So my business was a manufacturing business. We also did wholesaling and we provided service. So we had some aspects of several different kinds of businesses. So the company description section is going to contain your company name and I'll talk more about that in a minute. It'll contain the legal status and ownership and I'll also talk about different forms of legal status in a minute. Uh, it'll describe your company mission. I'll also talk about that. It'll give a bit of an overview of what your products or services are going to be and maybe what's unique about them. And then at what stage of development you're at. So have you already started the business? Are you, is it on paper only at this point? That sort of thing. Additionally, you want to have a clear detailed description of your products. If you can have a picture or an illustration or something, that's even better. Some brief description. There'll be a separate section that gets into your leadership team, but just a basic uh, overview, including whether you're going to have a board of directors or an advisory committee, and I'll talk more about that later, uh, where you intend to locate your business, and then your financial status, if you are capitalized or if you need capital, that sort of thing. So choosing a company name uh, is important and you have to recognize that the name of, a, of your product could be different than the name of your company. You could have uh, different names for different purposes. Um, as an example, when I first started working for Big Toys, that was the name of the product, but the company was actually called Northwest Design Products. They had an intentionally vague name because they wanted to have multiple different products uh, be produced by that same company. So that's why they chose to go that route. It's really important to do a search and determine if the name you're choosing is already being used by somebody else. So you can look that up through the Washington State Secretary of State's website or the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. The reason for that is if you choose a, a name of a product and then it's found out later that somebody else has a similar product with the same name. If they were there first, if they can show evidence that they were the first company in the market with that name, then you're required to change your name. And that can be expensive, like throwing away advertising, throwing away product packaging, all of that, and basically starting from scratch, letting customers know who you are. So a couple things that are important about the company name, it should clearly communicate with customers who you are and what you're about. It should be broad enough that you can do different things within, without having to change your company name. And one issue with using your own name in the company name, the advantage is people can equate that with dealing with an individual whom they may trust. The downside is, of course, when you sell your business, does it still make sense to have your name associated with it? So a little bit about different legal structures. So the simplest legal structure is a sole proprietorship. It's the most common in terms of number of businesses. It's when a single individual is involved in a business endeavor. Sometimes I do uh, financial forecasting for companies. I do that as a consultant and I do it as a sole proprietorship. So I just do that. I give them a bill and they give me money. So there's nothing really to do in terms of forming the company. The problem is there's no limitation on legal liability. That is reason alone for most of you not to take this form. What that means is if, say, you work on people's cars for a living and or for your sole proprietorship, you do that on the weekends in your garage, and you forget to uh, reinstall somebody's brake lines and they go down a hill and run into a bunch of other cars, they're going to sue you and they're going to win. And they'll not only take the assets of your business, but they'll take all your personal assets too. There's no distinction between your company and you personally. So you can lose everything you have. So that's reason enough not to pick this kind of uh, uh, structure. 
It is not taxable, meaning it goes onto your personal tax return, both the revenues and the expenses. It has a limited life. When you die, the business dies, and it's very difficult to raise capital and that kind of business to grow. Another way of doing it is to do a partnership, and I would argue against this. I, I'm not arguing against having partners, but I'm against having this legal structure. So uh, it is a little bit more difficult to form. Uh, you have to have a partnership agreement. Or you should have a partnership agreement that kind of lays out all of the rules that you all agree to follow in terms of how profits are split, who contributes what to the business in terms of time and energy, uh, how you'll uh, handle changes in partners. If somebody wants to leave, somebody wants to join, how do you deal with that? How do you break up at the end? It should cover all of that. The biggest downside is that there is no limitation on legal liability. So again, your personal assets are at risk in a partnership. To go further than that, it's called joint and several liability, which means that you're together all liable, but you're each liable personally for all of the debts of the partnership. So if you form a partnership with two people that have um, no personal net worth, you know, they're their assets equal their liabilities from a personal perspective, uh, and you do have money, well, anybody suing the partnership can come after you for all of it. Uh, even though you may only be a one third partner, you have to pay all the debt. So that's a big reason not to do that. So corporation is the most common in terms of revenue. So most, most companies, every company I've worked for has been a corporation. So that's a separate legal entity. It can enter into contracts in its own name. It can own property and incur debt, all of that in its own name. The biggest benefit is there is a distinction between the liability of the company and your personal liability. So as the owner of a corporation, your liability is limited to what you've invested in the company. That's the most you can lose. You're not going to lose your personal savings or your home or anything like that. The biggest downside is there's double taxation. So the income of a corporation is taxed. They file a tax return, a corporate tax return. They pay tax on their net income. Whatever is left over, if they choose to pay that out to their shareholders in the form of dividends, then you're taxed as individuals on the dividend revenue. So uh, a big portion of the net income gets taxed twice. That's the biggest downside. The form that I would suggest most of you adopt is being an LLC, a limited liability company. That has some of the benefits of corporation and some of the benefits of partnership. So one of the benefits of corporations that you get in an LLC is having that limited legal liability. So not having your personal assets be at risk. The benefit is that it's not taxable unto itself. The tax taxable income flows through the company onto the personal returns of the owners of the LLC, which are called members. So you're not having the income of the company taxed twice. There are some limits to how many members you can have in an LLC. There are some limits about the ability to go public. We'll talk about that later in the semester, uh, but it's really kind of the best of both worlds in terms of a format. So that's what I'd recommend. The mission statement of company really describes why you need to exist. Why should your company be there? Okay, so it should be very short, just a few sentences at the most, and it needs to be the kind of thing that is clearly understood by all employees. They need to know why, why they're there. So the benefit of this is it, if you keep returning to it and saying, wait a minute, what business are we in? This is the business we're in. It can keep you from going down tangent paths that take you away from what you're really all about. So it gives you kind of a reason to say no to some things you should say no to. So here's some uh, common mission statements from a couple of big companies. Uh, the one I like, uh, Google, to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. That's pretty concise, right, about what they're about. Uh, and you can read for yourself, uh, Nike, you know, uh, inspiring athletes, uh, of course, with Amazon and then Tesla's. So uh, if there are companies you admire or companies that are in a similar business of yours, I would go to their websites and look at their mission statements, and that might give you some inspiration for your own. A 
company's vision is a little bit different. It's a picture of where do we want to end up? Where do we want to be in five or 10 years? What kind of company are we going to be at that point? What are we going to do in the market for our customers? The culture of the business is kind of how you put your values into action. So it's what kind of a place are you going to be to work? Companies often uh, spend a lot of time on this and, and, and it's very important. So um, a lot of times they'll do that through anecdotes, through uh, symbols, language, through ceremonies, that sort of thing. A lot of times the origin story of the company becomes part of that company's culture and um, something that's kind of passed down. It'll include something about your competitive advantage. So that's also known as a core competency, or some people call it a unique selling proposition or a USP. Uh, that's identifying your target customers' needs and the capabilities of your competitors and saying, what are we going to do differently? And can we keep doing that? So is it sustainable and is it defendable? Are we going to be able to keep other people from kind of getting in on our action? So six factors of competitive advantage. One is you could be better in terms of quality. So the materials that go into your product can be better. The workmanship could be better. That could result in the product lasting longer or performing better for the customer. You could be better in terms of price. I wouldn't suggest you choose that one because it can be very, very difficult for a brand new company to produce products at a lower price than much larger companies that have economies of scale meaning they buy more materials at a time and get better pricing. So that wouldn't suggest that. Location could be as simple as being on the right side of the road. If you're a coffee shop and you are on a road that leads into a town where people are commuting, you want to be on the right side of the road for people that are going to work because people buy coffee in the morning. Being on the right side of the road is better than the left side of the road. So something as simple as that. Uh, selection, giving customers a greater variety, more options. This is something that a lot of times smaller companies are able to do better than bigger companies. Bigger companies want to standardize and have limited offerings so that they can kind of have a, a, a really strong system and process for creating orders and fulfilling them, where small companies are able to kind of customize and do things unique for each customer, which can be beneficial. Service, of course, is you. if you're a small company, you can know your customers by name. You could definitely give a higher level of service than a big company can. And then speed and turnaround. Nobody wants to wait. No matter what their product is, no matter what they need, they don't want to wait. So it's important to think that, uh, of the fact that not all advantages are meaningful to customers. This was an ad I saw. Uh, I think I saw it online or something on my iPad uh, about a, an Atlas uh, minivan from uh, Volkswagen that has 17 cup holders. I just can't imagine why anybody would want or need 17 cup holders. So every single uh, feature that you add to your product isn't necessarily going to be meaningful to the end users. So keep that in mind. One way to look at competitive advantage is to make a matrix like this. This is one that I did for outdoor fitness company that I worked with uh, before I started teaching full time. I looked at all the companies that were making that type of product in the US and you can choose anything you want for the uh, X and Y axis. In this case, I used uh, quality along the X axis and price along the right. And I mapped out where companies were in terms of quality, where they were in terms of price and you'll usually get a distribution like this, where the lower uh, left corner is the value or kind of Walmart um, range, and the upper right is kind of the Nordstrom um, better product, higher price range. Um, and you can see where companies fall there. Now, my company was Norwell, so I was able to do this to say, are we going to fit in this system, right? If you're in the lower right or the upper left, you're going to lose. Okay, if you have low quality, high price, you won't win. And it's impossible really to have high quality, low price. That never, never is feasible. So in this case, I was able to say, yeah, we're a higher quality objectively than any other company, but we're not the highest price. That's a good position to be in. You can use this to see, again, will you fit? And another way to look at this is, are there gaps in the market that you might be able to fill? Last thing I'll mention is economics of a single unit. So one thing you can do is say, um, how much am I going to sell a single unit for? 
So what is the sales price going to be for that unit? And what is the cost of goods sold for that unit? So the co cost of goods sold is the materials that you, you use to make the product and the labor that you use to make the product. So you compare that with the price of the product to see, are you making money on each unit or not? Do you expect that? So in this case here, we think we're going to sell a product for $20. We think the cost of goods sold is 12. So we'll have $8 of gross profit. That doesn't necessarily mean you're going to make money overall because it depends on what your overhead is, like your advertising and all of that. But if that is a negative number, then you know for sure you're going to have a loss. So you can't move forward if you have a negative number there. Hopefully that is helpful to you and I look forward to talking to you in the next lecture for chapter five. Thank you.